So, as introduction, I am Del Maud Ryan, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Education, Health, Social Services, Youth Affairs, Sports and Ecclesiastical Affairs in the British Overseas Territory of Montserrat. And I'm here representing on Deputy Premier duties as delegated by the Honorable Premier, Donaldson Romeo, who could not be here today. This afternoon, it is my task to share, to chair this session, which I believe would be a very informative and, and very um, interesting session because we will be speaking about how do we share the burden of the money spending, pretty much. So this, this session is on financing the sustainable development goals through public-private partnerships, the need for standards, institutions, and capacity building. And this afternoon, we will have our featured speaker, who is Professor Raymond Sanner. And following his presentation, we will also have a video presentation showing how the, pro the private sector partners with UNDP as, as UN as an example of how this can work in our territories or is working in our territories. So I will introduce Professor Raymond Sanner. And Professor Sanner is the titular in Organization and International Management at the University of Basel in Switzerland. He is a co founder of the CSEND. And CSEND is the Center for Social and Economic Development. And this is accredi accredited by the United Nations. The CSEND is, is found in a co founder of CSEND, a Geneva based non governmental research and development organization since 1993, and the director of the CSEND's Diplomacy Dialogue Branch. Professor Senna's research and consultancy focuses on the sustainable development goals, international trade and development, conflict studies, and international negotiations at bilateral, plurilateral, and multilateral levels in the field of trade, that's where WTO, employment and poverty reduction with the ILO and PRSP, Trade and Development with the WTO, UNCTAD, EIF, and Human and Social Capital Development in the Educational Sector, and that is with institutions such as the GATS, the ES, WTO, and the OECD. He also focuses on trade, investment, and climate change with UNCTAD. Professor Sanna is a pioneer who pioneered the field of business diplomacy and contributes within the field of diplomacy and teaches at diplomatic academies and schools in Europe and North America. And this is an area which he is very much familiar with and we look forward to his presentation. So now I will invite Professor Raymond Sanna to the podium to present to us on financing the SDGs through the public-private partnerships. Thank you. It's my first time in Jamaica, but for many years I have, of course, uh, appreciated uh, your musicians. Music, it's been mentioned already by Professor Sachs, yet it's one of the uh, a key of, of culture in terms of Jamaica, uh, as well as your sprinters, of course. Uh, but anyhow, to be here first time with you and to share uh, what I know about the SDGs. I've been working for the last four and a half years for UNDESA in terms of their Global Sustainable Development Review, uh, writing articles, being uh, in New York to do uh, sustainable development uh, presentation seminars and so on. So that's one thing that's in terms of my background. I just want to say that not just to give you a, a further lecture about things I've done, but to let you know where I'm coming from in terms of what I'm going to present. <coughs> and I've been very active at the United Nations Economic Commission in, in uh, Geneva in terms of public-private partnerships and how could that be best blended in with the SDGs, or maybe not. 
And this is what I'm, I'm going to present to you, and I look forward to your comments and maybe also disagreements. So I'm going to be talking about the SDGs, PPPs. I will give you an example of the standard setting process, which is right now happening at UNEC, uh, with the example of the health sector and how this worked or didn't work as much. And I will also make a few recommendations. So it's a bit of a, a presentation based on a policy analysis, but I'm adding a little recommendations which have a bit of an advocacy touch to it. So it's not going to be a purely neutral, as if there is ever going to be a purely neutral academic approach to policy analysis, but that will come at the end. <coughs> the SDGs. Well, we all have now heard and know about the 2030. Uh, the question now is how to then finance this. So <coughs> 17 is the one goal that would help us finance. Now, what do we uh, talk about financing? Um, what interests me particularly is target 17.17, which goes beyond the traditional PPPs. It's not just government, private sector. It says here very clearly, public, public, private, and civil society partnerships. So there is an invitation to go beyond simple private sector government partnerships. To me, this includes also, for instance, cooperatives. Now, in our countries, in Europe, my own, uh, we have Switzerland, 30% of our GDP is generated by cooperatives. So they have weight in North America as, as well. So we should think about PPPs in a broader sense than purely private sector government, how to then come up with feasible, sustainable partnerships that will be involving also other than private and public partnerships. That's a different question. Um, now, immediately a first comment. We all know goals are done, <coughs> targets are done as well. There's an, uh, an understanding we, will, we should not, not add more targets to what exists already. In that sense, we should live with that for the next 13 years. What's not yet finished are the indicators based on which we're going to measure whether we have reached what we promised to reach in our respective countries. Now, have a look at the indicator for 17.17. It says, maybe it's a bit too far for you to see, the amount of US dollars committed to public, private, and civil society partnerships. To me, this is just nonsensical. If we want to go and evaluate and measure, I mean, just to look at how much money was spent, first of all, how do we know for what is what? Uh, and what does it say except for money being spent? 17.4 which says, <coughs> assist developing countries in attaining long-term debt sustainability through coordinated policies aimed at fostering debt financing. Sorry, go back. Excuse me. Excuse me. Where was it? I think. Maybe I have to go back. Sorry. Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> to coordinate the policies aimed at fostering debt financing, debt relief, and debt restructuring as appropriate, and address the external debt of highly indebted poor countries to reduce debt distress. Now, I've heard today quite a few uh, have mentioned the region, a lot of countries are highly indebted. Um, I think this is something to take into consideration if we embark on PPPs. Will it just simply add more debt to already existing debt? Or will it generate a situation where debt can be reduced through the benefit of the type if it's a well done PPP? But the concern here is, this is all part of 17, right? 
Here, the indicator to measure whether 17.4 has been achieved or not, it just says debt service as a proportion of exports of goods and services. So here, it's been completely linked to the ability of countries to export, and by that, the assumption here is to reduce debt. Now, there are other things to be at least discussed or um, conceived of to bring down debt. It could be done through other means, <clears throat> not just simply through exports. You know, if you look at the risk to government or the risk to the private sector in terms of the policy options, some of that is classic. And I, I imagine that you have uh, dealt with this several times. If the government produces infrastructure, Professor Sachs was mentioning infrastructure before. Well, we could think of doing this as a government and use government resources to pay for it. And it doesn't mean then there is a risk to the private sector. Then we could also imagine to go through general public procurement. And that reduces the risk to the government, in increases a bit the risk of those companies who participate, who have won tenders, and are executing or implementing uh, public procurement projects. PPP is sort of the understanding it's shared. The risk is shared between two parties. We could also think that a government asks or proposes concessional approaches to uh, building roads or other infrastructure, as well as not only physical infrastructure, of course, we also talk about social infrastructure when we talk about health or education. And finally, we also have privatization, which would, of course, in that sense, reduce the risk to the government. And on the other hand, it could be then a full risk to the company which takes over. But here, of, of course, I think we all agree if there is a public enterprise that holds a monopoly, just to privatize that monopoly and make it private doesn't necessarily improve the economy. It could just lead to rent-seeking of those who are able to capture the uh, former public monopoly and then make it, in that sense, a private monopoly. So we have to also have an, uh, an idea that whatever we do in terms of government, <coughs> for civil society, as well as for the private sector, there should be some form of accountability. So we can follow and support the government's decision making as to what is being taken as a solution from uh, doing it just by the government or through public procurement or through PPPs or concessionally speaking or by selling it off. Uh, and on the other hand, if it ends up being privatization, it's all, we all know about this, I think, and you, you probably will fully agree with me. It's one thing to privatize. It's another thing to also regulate a more privatized economy. And if the regulatory functioning is nil, or just uh, at a very early stage, then we take the risk that somehow the privatization doesn't lead to long-term sustainable benefit, but it could lead to rent-seeking. But that's a different story, that's a different presentation. But anyhow, I wanted to say, here is the nomenclature about public-private partnerships. As you can see from the top to the bottom, there are nine forms of public-private partnerships. Can I see, by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with these nine forms of uh, public-private partnerships. Can I see by a show of hands? The mumbling means somewhat. <laughs> somewhat, <clears throat> yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, if we talk about public-private partnership, I leave, a, uh, I leave out civil society potential partnerships, like through cooperatives. Just the normal, traditional, public-private partnership. It's a métier, it's a business. And you see the kinds of public-private partnerships businesses do and propose to governments. So if on the government side, if you now think about the 13 years for SDG uh, implementation, 
if we think about let's do it through PPPs, and I mentioned before, the regulatory function of the governments is crucial. So if you don't know about this, what it means, how much of a risk it means to you as a government, uh, who should manage this, what are the legal implications, and not just the Ministry of Finance, right? Oftentimes when you think, oh, this is the Ministry of Finance, it's about money, they, will, they know how to do it. And oftentimes, maybe they have one or two experts. But the SDGs are interministerial, intersectorial, interdependent. A lot of times now, other ministries, the so-called line ministries, people who are part of a larger PPP, in these ministries, there should also be a know-how by ministries or by experts in these ministries what these PPPs are all about. So I think one precondition I would say before going into SDG-based PPPs is to have sufficient knowledge about the technicalities of PPPs so our governments don't end up signing something that they later on will regret or the next generation has to pay back, even though maybe the money wasn't worth spending. So the legal implications and the business implications of PPPs is crucial. Now, how to finance it? This is also mentioned by Professor Sachs before. I, I added this last night, just uh, anticipating maybe some of the discussions. Here, <coughs> we could, of course, do what uh, as we mentioned also professor sachs about the scandinavians you know how, how much of a tax on the average the scandinavian countries expect uh, that their citizens pay yeah it's about 40 40 40 plus and it doesn't matter yet it's if it's a government of of a party to the right or to the left even a government with a party in power that we could say maybe to the right side of the spectrum, hasn't reduced the tax somewhat a bit, but it's still around 40. However, I think uh, we all agree, the, the, the Scandinavians are willing to pay because they get something. There is a, a clear understanding of what the government is supposed to produce, deliver, give back in exchange of getting uh, uh, the taxes. But if you are in a country <coughs> where you have low income tax, where you have low uh, business taxes, where you have inability to collect taxes, uh, it's a much more difficult situation because the resources are not here. And on top of it, if you're already indebted, it will be very difficult to get additional money because in the financial markets, of course, they look at your indebtedness and then they judge whether this you know, would be a high risk premium, which means high interest rate to compensate for the risk of lending you money. So if that's the situation that you have, it is more difficult to go into PPPs because the government's resources are limited. So for that, I would say even more so, it should be very important that if you don't have many much resources, financial resources at your disposal, if you're government, that you should carefully look at these nine options to find out which one is the least risky and the most, in that sense, uh, doable for, for the country that you represent. <clears throat> how much is there to be spent and how to do it in terms of PPPs? Who is familiar with the UNECE? Can I see a show of hands? One. Je comprends. <laughs> now, even though it is the United Nations Economic Commission of Europe, uh, and we have the SCAP for Asia and, and, the, uh, and the one for Latin America, as well as the Economic Commission for Africa, they are, these are all sister organizations. However, some people in UNECE acted quite entrepreneurial. They started with the process of saying, hey, PPPs are important, and we should think of uh, coming up with standards. 
standards, how to do a PPP, for instance, in terms of road construction, in terms of uh, health facilities, because public information was not uh, information was not available, except for, of course, some of the consulting firms who specialized it on it, and of, uh, for them to share that information was on a paying basis. So UNEC started with it, and I'm now going to talk about one application uh, which I cl very closely followed, PPP standard for health. <coughs> there are different PPP standards that UNEC has developed and is developing. As you see here, it's about health, education, renewable energy, roads, smart cities. It's now a growing list of standards which are being uh, drafted, negotiated, and then made available to the public at large. <coughs> uh, the question is, who are the drafters? Who is involved in defining something that for some countries could be tempting to then take and make instantly uh, law? But because if somebody has already done that, it could be uh, used as a, a new uh, piece of law. However, if, if you look at the composition, who was involved in it, if you look at um, here, <coughs> the, who is part of the excellence group that looks at PPPs, we have uh, three, two consultants, government representatives, that's okay, that's a, a mixed background, but it's mostly Western Europe, Eastern Europe, a bit America, but not the rest of the other parts of the world, and mostly consulting companies and banks from Western Europe and so on. Now, now not, I'm not saying this is bad, business is bad, or consulting companies who are involved in PPPs, but by having purely in that sense a majority of companies who are involved in PPPs, of course, other stakeholders, such as governments, such as go uh, countries outside of the Northern Hemisphere and civil society, should be included to make it sustainable. Not, not so much about democracy uh, that I would like to emphasize, but if stakeholders, such as consumer groups, <coughs> civil society groups, in the health sector that means the medical profession, or nurses, or even um, other associations of, of uh, people, uh, patient, patient groups, if they're not involved in, in the drafting of the health standard, it could easily be in that sense biased towards more of the financing side. <coughs> they have always made uh, an effort to broaden, but it's so far been difficult for UNEC to have a real stakeholder-based, more comprehensive participation of the different stakeholders. It's, it's still very biased by the financial sector. But as you can see, they moved quite quickly. They're not, we're now here, 2014, on this chart. Uh, and there is a great effort to add more standards. I was invited to, to uh, participate in UNEC's uh, last conference in Hong Kong, which was also about uh, one belt, one road. China is very interested to use PPPs to finance part of the Central Asian um, uh, transportation uh, uh, traffic road. Uh, so the question there was how to think through PPPs, not only for the Chinese government or Chinese companies, but also for the other partner countries through which the one road and the one belt and one road will pass. Um, so the health sector, uh, which I looked uh, into detail uh, and also made some in initial constructive comments, uh, it, what I found out is it was very fast. 2014, they were trying to finish in one and a half years' time a standard on PPPs for the health sector. <coughs> But what I found out was that <coughs> um, the suppliers, you know, UNEC being a member of the UN family, to think 
the, the new challenge for UNEC was, as a UN institutional organization, they had to take into account the SDGs, once the SDGs have been signed. Uh, so the new step was to make, as it, it's called, people first PPPs, which is a form of uh, democratizing the PPPs. But in the health sector, um, there weren't as enough people from the production side involved in writing that particular standard. As I already mentioned, be it, be it the doctors or nurses or um, patient organizations, it was more, again, the um, supply side and less the demand side that was involved in drafting this particular standard. So I developed a grid, <coughs> um, might be useful for your own internal discussions as to whether or not you want to do a PPP that should, at the same time, reflect the spirit and the goals of the SDGs. So I have here an overall scoring, but it's based on a general criteria. It's in my paper, and it's, a, again, a bit difficult for you to, to see it in the, in the back. Whether it increases access to essential services in low-income countries, whether it improves efficiency and fills a capability gap in the public sector, and so on. These are general conditions. They can, you can give them a score. And then I also added the considerations based on assessing a PPP. What does it do to people? What does it do to prosperity? Not just poverty reduction, right? But prosperity. What does it do to, the pla to our planet? And what does it do to peace, particularly in countries where violence, where they are afflicted by violence? So you see, if you, if you go back, go back <coughs> We could use the grid or some adaptation of this grid to have a common base where we could, all the ministries included who are involved in a PPP, could come to a common understanding and a, ideally also common score. Is the PPP, as it's proposed, congruent with the spirit of the SDGs or not? Uh, so, uh, you know, the, we should also take into account the Addis Ababa action for financing, which emphasized infrastructure investment to achieve the SDGs. A lot of this, and it's in the paper of the Addis Ababa agreement, is expected to be done through PPPs. And we, I forgot uh, what Professor Sachs's uh, uh, numbers are in terms of the financing. How much is it? 1.3 trillion for the SDGs. It's phenomenal just in terms of the money that is expected to, that needs to be uh, found or generated through going through the financial markets or through PPPs to finance the SDGs. In uh, the Addis Abeba agenda, it's, it's again infrastructure projects to be financed, you can read it in the text, through PPPs. So what kind of PPP would you then agree to? Is it ending up with white elephant uh, projects that really are not useful for the economic development of the country, for various reasons that happens occasionally? Uh, or is it too expensive? Does it add more debt than it's beneficial? That consideration, I think, is very important to take into account. Now, because of the risk involved in maybe making the wrong kind of decisions when it comes to PPPs, agencies have met recently in New York the Interagency Task Force on Public-Private Partnerships. They're discussing how could there be an understanding, in a way, what not to do versus what should be encouraged. So this is working progress. Uh, and so I, what I, uh, as a conclusion, what I would suggest is the following. 
should consider the indebtedness risk. Does it generate more debt or is it something that generates more potential uh, revenues that could be used to pay off debt, either new debt or old debt? And I would very much propose, I've proposed this over the last two years, we should have a form of observatory. Maybe it sounds more noble in French, an observatoire. Uh, where there would be a place where uh, could be attached to a university where case examples of PPPs, successful and less successful, will be made available for countries as well as private sector and civil society groups who want to inform themselves as to these nine forms of PPPs. What happened there and then? Was it successful? If it wasn't successful, why was it not successful? So before taking a decision that could have an enormous impact on debt, and maybe even would be a wrong form of infrastructure development, there should be a place where countries, as well as the other stakeholders, could just go and get information and maybe take a decision that will be more informed. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation. If there are any questions before or after digestion, <laughs> maybe quickly now if there is some burning question that you might have. Really, how the micro, particularly micro enterprises, how they fit in in terms of the potential. Thank you very much. To the first question, <clears throat> Actually, it was just a week ago I was in Naples to give a paper on cooperatives because we don't know enough how to advise countries which have cooperatives, how could small cooperatives grow to become larger cooperatives. Oftentimes, they cannot make that growth trajectory and fail. So there is information on cooperatives and the ILO in Geneva has a unit which focuses on, on uh, cooperatives. I'd be happy to share that with you. For me, what I, I like about cooperatives, if it's a real cooperative, and let's be frank, there are also some that are just on paper a cooperative. Or in the past, uh, in the communist times in Eastern Europe, communist party officials would just hijack a cooperative and then uh, use it for their own uh, purpose. That's why in Eastern Europe, cooperatives is still something difficult to talk about, but it's getting better because people have now more distance to what happened during the uh, Cold War period. But cooperatives, to me, what is interesting is the ownership is different. It's a shared ownership. Not only do they produce, if it's a real cooperative, right, they produce goods and services, and have a shared uh, uh, ownership, which to me is, a, is a interesting. I don't mean to say the whole economy should be based on cooperatives, but it's an additional complementary form of um, working together and to what, I mean, you have housing cooperatives, health cooperatives, agriculture cooperatives, there are different forms of cooperatives. So information is available, I'd be happy to share that with you. Micro enterprises, we did um, 50 case examples of PPPs in developing countries during the, PP, during the uh, UNEC <coughs> conferences. And there were also case examples of cooperatives, for instance, in Haiti, agricultural cooperatives with a private sector uh, partner and government support were trying to produce agriculture basic food products, which Haiti lost uh, after they went through this unfortunate restructuring of the econ economy based on IMF suggestions. It was a it was a bread basket. They exported food, now they import food, and it's one of the sources of high indebtedness. So there, there is something that one could imagine. Uh, in, in terms of PPPs, it's not, of course also a question of size. Now, if, if it is an important project for a country's development, uh, maybe one idea could be to get some of the micro-enterprises to agree to cooperate 
It doesn't have to be, legally speaking, that they have to become a cooperative, but if they could cooperate with, with each other, then they have more bargaining power when they face buyers or uh, big um, multinational distribution companies. That could be one way to, uh, and that's what, that would be my, my, my answer to your question. I hope you we're all having a, a good uh, meal. Thank you very much to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and to our hosts from Jamaica for for this uh, uh, del delicious Jamaican lunch. Um, also, thank you to the Deputy Premier of Montserrat for for hosting uh, this uh, uh, this this event to have the opportunity in the tables to talk about the private sector. I think basically I'm just going to say a few a few remarks and I from from the. Uh, from the intervention of Professor Jeff Sachs, we got a, a lot of ideas on uh, very concrete on how much of a good business would be for the private sector to get in involved, to be engaged, or many of you are already part of this, already part of contributing to SDG. So we heard in the we heard examples in the health sector, in, in examples in the in the. Uh, in in the service sector, in different sectors. And uh, we also heard from uh, Pro Professor uh, Boland how much uh, the, the different, how different could be these arrangements between the public and the private sector, uh, also to the, both the benefit of, of uh, the, both the private sector and, and the public sector, but mostly in the benefit of how can we together advance the the, um, uh, the SDGs. And finally, in, in that uh, example from uh, the project about the gender seal, which tends to, which is another example on how much bringing women into the labor market, empowering women, bringing uh, gender equality within the business is actually a good business. So. Basically, what we are, the message that we are all, all saying here is uh, being part, engaging with the, uh, engaging in the agenda for, for sustainable development can actually be also a good business. And that's why we emphasize how important it is to have, uh, to have the private sector as a partner uh, in the Agenda 2030, how, in, how much uh, it can actually be beneficial, what we call the win-win-win, not only a, a economic or financial gain, but also a social gain and an environmental gain, if we must say. So this is basically what we are, are trying to, to make some concrete examples uh, of making, of using uh, whether you're you make an effort into bringing business uh, women into the business, into empowering women, into making more uh, equal the uh, the gender, the, the pay, or whether you are engaging in public-private partnerships or engaging in uh, in 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 business uh, that are anywhere from the tourist sector to the health sector to their very much is needed the, work, the, the engagement of the private sector. So thank you very much for giving us the, the opportunity to discuss, to at least uh, entice you to, to be part of this. Uh, it cannot, the, the sustainable development goals simply cannot happen without the, the private sector. And uh, I think uh, certainly from the UN uh, family, from, uh, and we are ready to, to work with you to, uh, perhaps uh, uh, guide you on some other ideas that we can have. I think we have heard great things this morning, and I'm sure throughout the conference, many more examples on how the business sector can be engaged in this global agenda. We will hear more. So thank you again uh, uh, the, the, to the Minister of, of Foreign Affairs, to the Deputy Premier of Montserrat, to the, the speakers, uh, and the guests, we have plenty of, uh, of um, things to hear and in interesting uh, discussions for the next, uh, uh, in the next two, two and a half days that are left in this conference. So thank you again. <laughs>